Good morning folks, welcome back. I hope you're keeping well. Chill in the air this morning, which is lovely. The sun's coming up and uh, I'm in a, a sea of Christmas trees. <laughs> Let me show you. Destined for the corner of many a living room this year, I'm sure. Because the sun's still very low, the forest is really dark. So I'll make use of this little bit of light. It's before 6 a.m. It's about 10 degrees and I'm in a, a wood that's got a lot of history attached to it. <laughs> in a place that's very close to where I live. It's already giving up potentials for photographs. I say that with a heavy heart because from where I live, this is the closest wood heading north. I've never been here to shoot and I have never actually treated this place like a destination. It's always been a route through to somewhere else. <laughs> Boy, am I kicking myself this morning. So uh, the reason I'm here today is partially because of YouTube and it's partially because of COVID. I'm certainly still sticking closer to home. I'm not traveling too far afield. Situation's not improving right now. So I don't think there's any need to travel further further afield when I've got places like this on my doorstep, you know? Anyway, where am I? I shan't bore you with all the history. I'll just give you the headlines. I think the first recorded mention of this place is with the Romans in about 600 AD. They had settlements out over to the east on the, uh, it's open flatland. And the coal seam was over to the west in Derbyshire. So what they used to do is they'd move from the settlements, come to this place as a stop off point. They would camp here, rest here, carry on to Derbyshire, rinse and repeat. And uh, there was a, a famous Roman warrior, um, Reg, Reg, we'll call him Reggie. No way am I gonna remember his name. I'll pop it on screen. And uh, he had a bit of a problem with the king, King Ethel, Ethel Frith rings a bell. It's probably not, so again, I'll pop it up on screen. Call him Ethel, King Ethel. And this famous Roman warrior camped here and waited for the king. They had a battle here. And in that battle, the Roman warrior's son died. His name was... <laughs> Reggie, Regia. No, won't have pronounced it right. I'll pop it up on screen and uh, Regia died in battle fighting King Ethel and from that point forward this is 617 AD I can remember that much this place was to be forever known as Regia's Wath a Wath being a crossing over water and that's what made this place so special it was uh, sheltered remember the east was flat and open so the, the Romans weren't used to the the joys of forest it had a supply of clean water and uh, there was a small settlement here very small so that's the first real mention of this place Regia's Wath became known as uh, Rain Wath or Reggie Wath or something along those lines I'll pop it up on screen and uh, that was in around I think 1190 saw the first action after that from the 600s and it was in the building of a, a hunting lodge and in 1212 a guy called Clint Eastwood it wasn't Clint Eastwood Cecil Rufus dodgy name anyway this dude he built a hunting lodge and it's recorded again that in 1212 Clint uh, hosted King John who came here to hunt and that brings me to the point that this is very much what was in the heart of ancient Sherwood. Sherwood has spoken in the old tongue as is currently naming this channel and this was very much part of that place. Clint hunted in the forest of Shirewood with King John. There's all sorts of links, tenuous links to King John and the King's Way, the, the route that he would have traveled where that is in relation to the forests around here that are here today. There's also ties from this place to an abbey, which is over yonder. That abbey was built in, I think around 1170, with ties to 
the potential for a fry talk. Long story, won't bore you. So anyway, cutting to the current day. In 1911, a man who lived at that abbey, at the abbey, in a manor house, Lord Saville of Topard, very posh, handlebar moustache, 1911, sure he would have driven a Rolls Royce. He leased some of this land to a uh, mining company and the mining company dropped two shafts in 1911. By 1913 they found coal 554 yards deep straight down. Uh, same year sadly there was a tragic accident and something like the winching gear failed and tackle dropped and killed 13 men, 14th man died later. Uh, I think they rescued one man found clinging to debris in the bottom of the shaft, floating in freezing cold water. So it was a tragic, tragic start. And it still, it still lives on to this day. It's still, yeah, it's still known by the local people. So of ancient times in summary, this was a tiny place up until the, the 16th century when even then it was just known as a, I think it was quoted as being a pleasant little place um, with 13 dwellings of which four were farmsteads and one was a pub. <laughs> That's what this place consisted of in the 16th century. So you can see how small it would have been in the 11th century. Today, village is it's a mile over, over there. A uh, population of, I think it's between six and a half and 7,000 people today. So over those centuries, it's gone from Regiers Wath to Regwath to Rayenwath. <laughs> and uh, ultimately, we soften everything and it's become Rainworth. That's what we do to stuff. The mine, further over to the uh, direct east, sun rising, is telling me that's the east. And all the land now is just one huge grey scar. When you look at it on Google map, it's like a thick grey sludge. It's almost like a, a clay. It's horrible. It's really, really manky stuff. It sets like cement and it smells like seaweed. It's shocking stuff, but it's come straight out of the earth and it's been spread around over the, the decades. Yeah, further over to the north there, they, they had a, a, a formal slurry tip. It was like a, it's like a small Mount Everest. But it was just grey, it looked like the moon when you, you went up close to it. And I think what's happened is that uh, there's quite a lot of heavy uh, excavation going on in the area. It seems to be bringing the land back. So I know from looking at it on Google Earth, where it's grey there are piles of bright yellow sand. This is all sandstone in this area. And that's why the pines grow here so freely, because they don't, they don't mine a sandy subsurface. So. It almost looks as if that old land is being reclaimed. I hope it is. But my fear is that what they'll do is they'll industrialise it. So they'll probably just build an estate on there in the middle of the woods somehow. But anyway, we'll see. So anyway, that's where we are today. Honestly, I'm a little bit nervous because I know there are parts of this place that are beautiful. I've ridden through it so many times. I've lived within five miles of this place all my life and I've never visited it with the intention of shooting, which is nuts. It's absolutely nuts. How can that happen, eh? I wonder if you've got anywhere close to you that you've never really paid any attention to. It's interesting, isn't it? It's amazing what uh, the whole lockdown situation enables you to think, think through different perspectives on your environment, perhaps. Anyway. The purpose of today is really just to come in here and shoot, find a few shots and have a mooch about. Over to my left there, not, within walking distance, there's a, uh, an ancient oak woodland as part of this place. And it is ancient as well. It's uh, registered and protected as a site of special scientific interest. I need to go over there, but that's really a two-wheel day. It's over the far side of this place and uh, it's a bit more difficult to get to, so I'll save that for another day. <laughs> You're lovely, mate. Little bit of cloud diffusing things, softening it up, which is nice. Cool place. And this is the coolest it's going to be for the next week. We've got a heat wave coming. It's likely to reach 36 degrees by the weekend. 
So I'm making the most of this call today and I'm going to make my way into the woods now. We're off into here. As soon as I find a composition, I'll set up, bring you back and explain it. So I'll catch you in a minute. I just spent an age recording that then and I hadn't pressed start on the camera. <laughs> These things happen. I'm in the bottom of a hollow, sleepy hollow. It's like a huge crater. Bounding out the back of it is that monster. He's beautiful, absolutely beautiful. And his mate in the background there. And what I've just been t telling you, I can summarise it now. Top tip, if you have ever walked into a woodland shooting and spun around and come out the same way, what you'll realise is, often is the case, the best compositions are on the way out. <sighs> often is the case, I find compositions on the way out. Let me say that much. And as a result, when I come into a place like this and I'm uh, off in bit and I'm doing a circular route, I'm, I'm always turning around and looking behind me. I'm always looking for the composition that I've just passed as well as what's ahead. And that's what's just happened to me now. As I was walking along this path, I've come in this direction, I was, I'm headed that way. The sun's over here and it was a little bit brighter than it is now. Um, and as I was walking along, I knew the sun was over my right hand shoulder. It's up there. And I knew that the forest I'd just come through, I've come through in this direction and walked around here. I knew what was, what was over there. So I was looking behind myself every, every minute or so. And as I came down to the bottom, bottom of this hollow, it's always an opportunity to take an unusual perspective through the forest floor because you can effectively get, get really low without actually being on the dirt. And that's what I did here. So. That's really at my head, head height at the moment, and I'm down here in this uh, mucky stuff. But it's enabled me to position my camera at the forest floor level. And it's given me a composition on this fallen silver birch here. That's the thing that took my eye. Now the sun's coming up over there, and when it was brighter, it was hitting the edge of this silver birch and there was a line of light coming through the forest floor. So what we have, or what we had, because it's changed now, is that silver birch getting the sun, hitting it, leading off to, up to the right, and in frame, it, it led into, this is actually an oak tree, I think. There's an oak there leaning over in that direction and I've made up a composition, I'll show you shortly, on the uh, Sony. <laughs> the light came in there and fed in a single string of light. So it was all coming to the one focal point, which is actually on the path. It's never going to win any awards. I understand that. And it's not a particularly great scene. The reason I'm explaining it is for the photographic concept. Because my idea is to take multiple shots at a shallow depth of field, working my way up this trunk. So I'll show you in camera. So what I've got here is, um, you can see there the, uh, the silver birch sits in the bottom left hand corner and squiggles its way up there to the right. And you can see even now how much, how much brighter that is than the, the forest floor. It was even brighter than that and sort of an orange lit with the, the sunrise coming up over here. And then here we've got this fallen or leaning oak. So we've got a line into the wood. That line drawing our eye, either whichever way you look at it, down towards the same focal point or up the frame. And the light here was also balancing it out. So that was drawing, it was wider over in this direction coming to a point here. So everything gravitates to that bottom corner third and there's the path that leads up and out. So what I was doing was I was taking an in focus shallow depth of field in the bottom left hand corner off the silver birch. So I have that area in focus and then I moved a little way up 
took another shot, a little way up, another shot, and I had about five of them strung along that silver birch. And then I think I took three, one in the far distance on the sun in the forest floor, on the grass there, and another one in the center and another one here. Now I won't use all those shots. I'll probably just use three or four of them. Um, and it's a bit arty farty, but <laughs> my idea is that I do this sometimes. I like to create compositions based on focus rather than just light. So it's a combination thing for me. And this will either work a treat or it won't, but either way, it's just so that I can share with you the concept. That effectively is the creative composition. It's a three-way draw to a central focal point. We've got the, the foreground highlights on the silver birch, and we've got interest from the midground with the what my intention is is to make that that light off the forest floor also in focus. There will be a band of focus there with the light, there'll be a band of focus running up the silver birch and I'll see what happens with the oak, not too worried about that, but I'll work on those three elements and aim to get the background soft. That's the creative shot. Sometimes, sometimes they work a treat and sometimes they don't, but it's just, uh, just something I wanted to share. If ever you get an opportunity to wander a circular route around a place, try and keep an eye over your shoulder. <laughs> It's always worthwhile just checking back because often's the case that's 50% of your walk and 50% um, of your opportunities. Don't know what's going to happen with that. And that's part of the fun of it. It's just having a go, trying it out and uh, playing with what, uh, what light we get given. So I'm, I'm slowly getting eaten here midges are out and uh, I did have a bit of a spray up this morning but they seem to be attracted to it rather than repelled by it. Right then folks, onwards and upwards. Let's go and try and find another one. There's a fox round here somewhere. I can smell him. My eye keeps getting drawn over here somewhere because I'm just looking at the back of the GoPro. I see these three silver birch limbs all leading me into the woods there. I don't know how it happens. I don't know how, I don't know how I can live somewhere so close to somewhere like this and not have him, I've never been in here to shoot. I don't understand it, it's, 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 it's madness. I've been everywhere else, <laughs> apart from the one closest, most, well, on the northern side, it's the closest woodland to me. I don't know why, I don't know why I haven't been here. I've got no idea. You know when it'd be nice in here is when it's raining. I mean, look at this, I've just gone from, I've just gone from that mixed woodland there, oaks, silver birch, sleepy hollows, dirty foxes in need of a shower, you name it. And then this is the trail I'm going to take, right, which is along that path there, follow the forest floor, I get to another mixed woodland at the end, but then there's this. All this fernage. That's the way I came in, right over there on the horizon, and I've walked all the way up around into this woodland through this beautiful mixed woodland around foxy corner over this log voila and i'm headed down there such a diverse forest environment from the pines and the mixed woodland to i know there's a lot of silver birch down there and some quite dense shrubbery but you can get in under the canopy okay i've cycled through it so many times you know the difficulty is when you're on two wheels you don't stop you know you're always moving and you don't get to pause and think about where you are and check out the light it's already behind you you know
craziness. Anyway, I want one more decent composition today. I'd like to find a nice shot, if I can. And uh, I'm going to put the camera down, think about where I am, consider the light, and uh, bring you back when I find something. If I don't, next time you see me, it'll be to wrap up for today. But it's great. It's really great. Wish you were here. <laughs> Not all of you, that'd be horrible, but one at a time maybe. <laughs> oh, it's another cobweb. Oh. Right. Off down my trail. I'll see you in a bit. Just as a, a tribute to being here really. I think it's I think it's nice to unfold some of your photographic personality if you've got a YouTube channel. I like personally I like that idea. I love to see when you know photographers that that post to YouTube post their some of their character, you know. You see how you see how they interpret shots and you see what they go to, what their likes, preferences are and their style is, you know, their, their photography over time becomes apparent and um, it's nice to see. F for me, I, I don't have a traditional approach. I'm not, I've been quite derogatory about it in, in how I've said it, so I apologize for that because that's not my intention. I've called them boutique shots. And that's the wrong word. It's not. It's not a pretentious thing. It's it's quite right the way, you know. Often, standard styles of shot are described. The concepts of leading lines, of light and shadow, of the rule of thirds, and all the other myriad of different techniques about forming compositions and structuring your shots. I question none of it. I don't understand all of it. I really appreciate much of it. It helps It helps me for my own compositions. And I follow some of them loosely, but <sighs> loosely is the key word. <laughs> I don't gravitate towards the stereotypical compositions. That's the point. It's just not, it's just not me. I like to break rules. I don't like to, I don't like to, be confined by rules. I like to have creative freedom. And for me, that means breaking rules. I'm going to be blatantly honest. I enjoy breaking rules. <laughs> I love it. And if I like, that, because I shoot for myself, if I like that end result, even if compositionally it makes no sense whatsoever, great, bring it. I'm okay with that. No problem at all. However, none of us want to shoot and share our work and it not meet you know the appreciation of a few people it's nice when you share your stuff if somebody says you know oh i really like that shot but with sincerity and and you know whilst we don't shoot for others perhaps indirectly i can't i kind of guess this part of us does you know we don't we don't just shoot for ourselves all the time and there's a complexity to all of this i'm not going to even begin to go into I just enjoy breaking rules and I love to see other YouTube photographers work within the confines they give themselves. It really intrigues me, interests me and I appreciate all of them immensely. There's so much talent out there, it's incredible. I won't list names today but there are many and uh, I'll certainly share some and try and perhaps emulate some of the, the style, some of these, these shooters of have got and bring it to the woodland if they're not already woodland photographers most of them are but the reason for that waffle is just because whilst i'm here i've come down this little trail and uh, i've come in from over here and as i've come down i've got a stereotypical shot and really it's that 
squiggly little S bend that leads you through a frame like so and on camera the composition looks something like this well we've got the path leading through the frame I'm at f18 I've got a 1.6 second exposure at minus 0.3 of a stop and the nice thing about this is I've got absolutely no sky in there whatsoever in a portrait orientation focused in on the mid ground of the trail where I want it nice and sharp pop it up on screen now hope one or two of you like it no rules were broken in the taking of this photograph <laughs> oh. right then folks that's a taste of uh, Reggie's Wath Crikey, that language must have took some learning back in the day. Yeah, it's much easier to say rain with, isn't it? But hey, it's a slight, a slight glimpse at the entrance side of it. There's so much more to explore, so much more. I'm, uh, I'm just a bit flabbergasted that I've never taken the time to stop, bring a camera, you know. It seems a bit silly jumping in the car to drive a couple of miles down the road at most. But having done it this morning, it's well, been well worth it. It has been well worth it. And I'll be back again for sure, but I'll take a completely different route in next time and I'll come straight through and try and get over towards where the ancient oak forest is, site of special scientific interest. It's beautiful. It's all very beautiful. And... Um, Yes, we're close to a little bit of industry in that direction, but the old mine is no longer working and hasn't for decades. There is some work taking place, but hopefully that's putting nature back. It'd be nice to think it was happening, wouldn't it? Anyway, for today, that's a wrap. So thank you very much for watching. Please take care of one another. And as ever, if you can't be good, just be careful. I'll see you soon. Bye for now.